What is happening to Sierra space? That's a question that's been confounding a lot of spaceflight enthusiasts as of late, including myself. There hasn't been a great number of updates as to when Dream Chaser is finally going to be taking flight. By the way, Dream Chaser Tenacity is not the test article that you're looking at right now. This was from years ago when Sierra space was still looking at Dream Chaser as being a manned spacecraft, something that may happen in the near future, but definitely not what Dream Chaser Tenacity is or the next vehicle under construction is either. But until a few days ago, these were the only things that we knew for sure about Dream Chaser. Number one, the FAA has not given the go-ahead for this vehicle to re-enter the atmosphere and land at Cape Canaveral after multiple Starship anomalies scattered scattering debris all over the Caribbean, the FAA still doesn't regard this spacecraft as being a safe vehicle to re-enter the atmosphere and land at a NASA facility very strange and no new developments as far as i have heard and nothing in the press about that either but what we have heard is that sierra space's ceo tom vice stepped down at the beginning of this year unexpectedly in january of 2025 Again, he had not previously announced any plans to retire and had been CEO since mid-2021. When the company issued the statement about his retirement, Vice was still listed on the Sierra Space's website in his roles as chief executive and a member of the company's board of directors. So that was a very abrupt development indeed. And since that time, we haven't heard a great deal about Dream Chaser at all. Until now, finally Sierra Space gave us a much needed and exciting update about their first cargo that they will be carrying in conjunction with the first cargo to the International Space Station. There's an article that's been written about this cargo entitled The Pursuit of Better Drugs Through Orbital Space Crystals. Let me tell you something. This cargo could not be better suited to Dream Chaser, and I'm going to explain why that's the case in just a moment. Good morning, space flight enthusiasts, and welcome to a special Angry Bulletin. We'll be talking about Sierra Space and Dream Chaser finally today. For quite some time, I've been concerned about Sierra Space. They didn't show up to the Space Symposium. They haven't been sponsoring a lot of the same things that they used to sponsor, and there's been a shakeup with their staff as well. I have to admit, I was a little concerned that their funding might be running out, especially given the fact that Dream Chaser's first launch appears to have been delayed again and again and again. And still, at this point, the FAA has not given a launch license to this vehicle or permission to land at Cape Canaveral, which is obviously necessary if this thing's ever going to be reused. But finally, things have changed very much for the better. Sierra Space has announced that they have a new cargo, or rather the first confirmed cargo, aside from the supplies and such that they're going to be bringing up to the International Space Station with their first test. And this cargo is quite vital indeed. The sorts of cargoes that other spacecraft have been carrying to orbit lately, medical experiments that work far better in microgravity than in a normal 1G laboratory environment, but there's something very different about Dream Chaser's capabilities that make these experiments far more likely to succeed with this spacecraft than with others. So in the course of this video, I'm going to be quoting extensively from an article from The Verge entitled The Pursuit of Better Drugs Through Orbital Space Crystals. No, not those sorts of drugs, the kind that could save your life. 
and this could not fit better into Sierra Space's vision of a better future through space technology. Quote, In the Andromeda strain, Michael Crichton wrote about killer alien space crystals that are, spoiler alert, ultimately stymied by Earth's breadth of pH values. In reality, crystals grown in space could be key to a new generation of cancer-fighting treatments that save lives, not threaten them. Colorado-based startup Sierra Space is nearly ready to launch its reusable space plane Dream Chaser. Well, let's hope so. It's set to carry into orbit a 3D printed module designed by engineers at pharma giant Merck. If the test goes well, and if Dream Chaser's gentle re-entry process keeps that sensitive cargo safe, this could be the start of something big, despite those crystals being microscopic. Space crystals sound like something an astrology guru would hang over their bed to keep them asleep, but there's real science here. According to the ISS National Lab, crystals grown in space are simply better. Scientists hypothesize that these observed benefits result from a slower, more uniform movement of molecules into a crystalline lattice in microgravity. Research into monoclonal antibodies points towards crystallization as being key for developing a more stable, subcutaneous delivery mechanism. Theoretically, expensive chemotherapy sessions could be replaced by injections that a patient could self-administer at home. It's the stuff of science fiction. And in the case of the Andromeda strain, it literally is. But the truth is actually close to Back to the Future. Space crystal research actually began in the early 80s, first on one-off rocket flights and eventually on the space shuttle. There was much hope and hype about the tech back then, but it was ultimately stymied by two things. The first is cost. The space shuttle orbiter was to be America's low-cost orbital research transporter, but that never panned out. NASA's own permission costs pegged each flight at somewhere around $1.5 billion. That's simply far too expensive. Even in the pharma industry where reporting quarterly profits often requires seven or more digits. The rise of SpaceX and its competitors has brought these costs down substantially, lowering the cost of getting cargo into space to a relatively paltry $2,000 per kilogram. But that still leaves the other problem, shock. If you're going all the way to orbit just to grow some ultra-fine structures, you don't want to rattle them to pieces on the way back down. Quote, It's about a 20 mile per hour car crash equivalent into the ground, Dr. Tom Marshburn said of the experience of landing in a capsule like the Crew Dragon. And he would know Marshburn is chief astronaut at Sierra and the company's VP of Human Factors Engineering. But before that, he was a NASA astronaut. He's flown on the shuttle, the Soyuz, and the Crew Dragon. Sierra and its reusable Dream Chaser aircraft stand poised to fix both both problems, cost and shock, in one fell swoop. Those of us of a certain age will likely feel a sort of irritational affinity for Dream Chaser at first glance. Its black and white color scheme and simple lifting body design give strong space shuttle orbiter vibes. And that's for the average observer. I'm sure the rest of us all recognize the similarities. But this is no retro design intended to earn a throwback cred. Dream Chaser has some major advantages over the shuttle. For one thing, it's much smaller, about one quarter the length. If fits neatly inside a payload compartment of a ULA Vulcan rocket, not requiring the messy combination of tanks, liquid and solid fuel boosters, and endless specialized hardware that stymied any hope that the space shuttle had in being profitable. It also doesn't require a three mile long runway like the shuttle. It can do a precision landing anywhere a 737 can land. The biggest change though is that it won't fly with crew on board, for now at least. Dream Chaser was born out of the Commercial Crew Transportation Capabilities contract, a competition that also included SpaceX's Dragon capsule and Boeing's <coughs> Starliner capsule. NASA selected two winners, and Sierra Space was unlucky to place third. And in my opinion, the American Space Program was unlucky when that decision happened as well. 
However, seeing this potential, NASA offered enough orbital contracts to make a Dream Chaser reboot worthwhile. A subtly redesigned space plane will launch and land as planned, just minus the people. Why did NASA want to keep Sierra Space in the loop? Dream Chaser's design offers some real benefits, particularly as we potentially enter an age of space manufacturing. Quote, a capsule like a dragon, by the nature of the physics and the shape of it, can bring down only half of what it takes up, says Megan Crawford, founder and managing partner at Space Fund, an early stage venture capital investment fund with a focus on commercial space. The space plane has the opposite physics. It can bring down twice as much as it takes up. An ideal orbital transport and manufacturing network then has a combination of the two. That's the potential. For now, the project with Merck is something of a proof of concept, a 3D printed module containing a series of tubes, plungers, and capsules. Once it gets to the ISS, a willing astronaut will turn some valves in sequence, and then the resulting concoction will be shuttled back to Earth for someone at Merck to examine, and they'll be able to do it quickly. Dr. Marshburn said that traditional re-entry capsules like Dragon or Soyuz often spend days bouncing on boats or trucks before their cargo can be retrieved. Dream Chaser, however, was designed for cargo to be offloaded within an hour after its wheels stop rolling. The Merck module will test that quick retrieval, plus the soft landing, ensuring the potential for this sort of crystalline growth in space. And though the ISS is itself set to be decommissioned at the end of the decade, Sierra Space is positioning its own inflatable orbital modules as a commercial alternative free of the politics and oversight of the ISS. Space Fund's Crawford said that the economics are sound and the proof is in the number of players trying to capitalize on the space plane market. Startups like Venus Aerospace, Radiant Aerospace, Dawn Aerospace, and Virgin Galactic each have their own aircraft in development with goals ranging from cargo to space tourism. Space drug development has the potential to be hugely promising, but Sierra has a few other arrows in its quiver. It's partnering with Honda to get a next-gen fuel cell into space. And those of you craving smaller and better processors could be in luck too. A startup called SpaceForge plans to grow processor substrates in orbit, another area where gentle touchdowns are key. In shattering today's mission cost barriers, Sierra Space might just blow through the semiconductor nanometer barrier too. There's hope for one more type of cargo to come out of these missions as well. For now, Dream Chaser is relegated to transport only cargo, but the stumbles of the Starliner program, which all of us are very aware of, could reopen the door to hauling humans. Quote, you see a winged body and of course astronauts, especially test pilots. We want to be in that, Dr. Marshburn said. At any point, we'd be able to leverage the work that's already been done to get that ready. And if that does come to pass, which hopefully it will, tenacity, the first dream chaser is going through its final checks at NASA, waiting for its chance to head to the ISS sometime later this year. And the second dream chaser called Reverence is currently under production. In other words, watch this space. So there you have it. Really, really exciting news. Once again, I can't wait for this launch to take place, but I have some concerns as well, to be honest. Just got another go ahead, as most of us probably know from the FAA, for a Starship to fly again. And in spite of the fact that SpaceX continues to maintain that the debris from their previous two incidents didn't go outside of the assigned exclusion zone, well... You may hear an aircraft in the background, by the way. I'm here in New York, uh, going to be grabbing my flight back to London tomorrow. In any event, all that having been said, I kind of question whether or not SpaceX is being completely accurate about where all of the debris went, given the fact that a piece of debris actually struck a car where 
absolutely no cars should have been. And in addition to that, we have a much bigger exclusion zone that the FAA has cleared out for this Flight 9 than they ever have before. All that having been said, it is disgusting to me that the FAA still has not given permission for Dream Chaser to re-enter and make its landing approach at Cape Canaveral. It's a much smaller spacecraft, a spacecraft that is far more mature in its development process, and yet still, as far as I know, the FAA has not given their go-ahead for this vehicle to land. Do we have preferential treatment being given to Elon Musk because of his position in the government? Is he getting the go-ahead from the FAA for a much more problematic vehicle simply because of who he is and the position that he has? Well, can't say for certain, but I have to admit, I'm a little concerned about the whole thing, and I really hope that the FAA gives Sierra Space the go-ahead soon. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and also please consider supporting me. All the details are in the description. That's the only way that I got to Washington, D.C. prior to my uh, trip to New York to get back to London. That's the only way I got to the archives, get some unique content that you folks will be seeing very soon. So until next time, stay angry about space.